Now, uh, this lab was actually part of this particular topic. Uh, our topic right now is going to be talking about pest management and, and the different techniques uh, that, that we use to manage these pests. Now, we teach an entire course on this, uh, uh, on different components of this. We, we actually have a course that we teach on pesticide science. Uh, and it, it talks about all the different kinds of pesticides, their chemistry, modes of action, formulations, how they're applied, and, and so forth. Uh, we also have a course on strictly biological control. Uh, that, that talks about uh, you know all, all the the parasites, predators, and and uh, pathogens that attack insects. So there there's other courses that we have. We're really just only going to give you a, a basic rudimentary uh, idea of of what these uh, management techniques and and methods are are uh, like and what they're used for. Uh, and then we're going to sort of start the last half of the course and and be aware. Uh, there's going to be some changes. I'll, I'm going to try to work on it tomorrow, but I'm going to revise the syllabus uh, for the end of the course. There will be a couple of lecture topic changes uh, because I'm, I'm going to have, I've got Denisha working on a couple of lectures that I'd like to have her give uh, in the last week of the course. Uh, and that means I've got to sort of rearrange some of the, the other lectures around. The labs will remain the same. Uh, this next week's lab uh, is, is going to be uh, on what I will talk about today and on Tuesday, some of the pantry pests and household pests, uh, plus some other products uh, that uh, you might get, as I indicated to you before. Uh, I'll bring in some insect-related foods uh, that, that you can eat and, and uh, hopefully enjoy. I, I, uh, I really love Fig Newtons, uh, and I'll bring you in uh, some Fig Newtons to, to chow down on if you'd like to do that. On Tuesday, uh, we had just started uh, uh, pest management. We went through this whole laundry list of terms in there, what kind of pests, uh, you know, are they chronic pests, are they imported pests, or exotic pests, and, and so forth. But what I wanted to do today is sort of paint a picture of how we got to where we are today in pest management. In the laboratory, I talked about integrated pest management, and we spent this week in the laboratory talking about chemical controls, primarily pesticides, and tried to give you an idea of how you can actually determine the toxicity uh, or the relative toxicity of, of those uh, pesticides. Well, basically, how did we get here? The, the short history of, of this is that uh, generally defined, uh, after the Second World War is what we call the chemical control era. Uh, when we were in the, the Second World War, uh, we were finding that our troops were actually dying more of insect-related diseases. We were going into areas where we, we had lots of malaria. Uh, we uh, Almost everybody had lice, body lice at that time. Uh, and when you get a bunch of troops together, uh, uh, you can get uh, typhus spread pretty quickly uh, by, by those lice. And so we needed things that would control the insects uh, because in some, some of the, the hemispheres of, of battle, we were actually lo losing more of our troops to the diseases uh, that insects bore than to the bullets and bombs and everything else. And so it, it was, and, and when you look at it now, it was a really kind of an interesting thing going on there. Uh, the Germans also, they had a top secret uh, pest control group. They were trying to figure out how to kill, kill these things. We had a top secret uh, group here. It, it was almost as, as secret as, as the atomic bomb uh, project and so forth. But at the end of the war, uh, we, we did find some of these, uh, what we call the, the modern synthetic uh, chemistry that were was truly miraculous. Uh, just minute amounts of these chemicals uh, could wipe out virtually all the insects. Because in essence, the insects had never experienced these chemicals, so they had no resistance. They had no ability to withstand those. Now, before that period of time, we, we generally call this the pre-chemical era. Uh, what was it that we were doing uh, to manage these pests? And I did mention in, in the laboratory the, uh, some of our colonial forefathers talking about actually taking brooms and going out in the field and, and beating the army worms back uh, from eating their wheat crops and, and other crops that, that were out there. And in essence, that's what we did. Uh, if, if you take a look at, at the history of this, there was a, a big move towards cleanliness. Once we found out that rats 
were harboring fleas that were transmitting the plague, uh, that, that uh, cleanliness was important. And, and you take a look at all the, the major cities. Uh, it used to be if you were in London back in the, the 1700s, you had to keep your ears open very well because somebody up there in that building might say, watch out below. What were they doing? They were literally dumping the chamber pot out the window. <laughs> and so if you think about it, in the 1700s, that was actually the first development of sewer systems and septic systems and things like that. We found out those were related to diseases and, and so forth. So when we didn't have these chemicals, uh, we used primarily uh, mechanical, physical, cleanliness exclusion type of techniques which we would now call cultural controls. Now there were some insecticides at, at that time. I find it really interesting that even all the way back to the Egyptian era, the Egyptians knew that there was a specific type of chrysanthemum flower that if you ground up the flower petals into a powder and sprinkle this powder around, if the insects walked across that powder, they would be killed pretty quickly. We now know that as pyrethrum, and, and it's still available today, still pretty good. And, and so there were some botanical insecticides. <coughs> we also knew that there were some chemicals that would do a pretty good job of killing insects. Mercury chloride, lead arsenate, Wow. <laughs> and and you, you might cringe at that, but uh, if, we, if we do get time for me to give my lecture on, on pest control by the Victorian housewife, we will learn that the Victorian housewife, number one insecticide was mercury chloride. Uh, that's what they used to control bed bugs and, and other insects around the house. So uh, I always have to chuckle when, when you hear people that buy these old Victorian homes and they do swabs around there and they find mercury and lead uh, on the walls of that and they claim it's the paint. No, Victorian housewives actually painted that in egg whites around the cracks and crevices of, of the, the homes uh, to get rid of the bugs that were in those homes. So it wasn't necessarily in the paint. It was actually painted on uh, the woodwork in order to keep those down. So those are, are basically uh, the things that we used uh, all the way up in, into the, the 20s, 30s, and early 40s. Uh, those were the materials that we had. Those are the materials that we used. Now, also another inorganic one that was kind of interesting to me is sulfur. Uh, elemental sulfur is a pretty good insecticide and miticide. Also, elemental powdered sulfur is a, a pretty good fungicide. And, and so I still remember to this day uh, when visiting my grandparents uh, on, on the farm in Kansas, Grandpa would always, he had this little tray of the smelly orange powder. And he would go over to that tray before he'd put his socks and boots on and he would pick it up and dust his lower legs and then he'd put his socks and shoes on and go out in the field. Well, he would come back at the end of the day. We always just thought it was a, the, that maybe he just tasted really bad. Uh, but he never got any chiggers and he never got ticks. And now I know what that was. It was powdered sulfur that he was putting on there and, and that was a repellent uh, to the, the ticks and, and chiggers that are in there. <coughs> As I've already indicated to you, there was a big move uh, in, in the Second World War to discover new molecules, and, and we discovered what we call the synthetic organic molecules. Now, I know that sounds like a misnomer, but uh, remember we're talking about organic being in the organic chemistry. That means that these are molecules that contain primarily carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and a little nitrogen in them. And, and what we found is that there were some of these that, uh, and it's really, to me, amazing. DDT was actually discovered by a German chemist in the late 1800s. This guy had, had, he says, this is an interesting molecule. It's designed this way. That's the, the form of it, but I see of no value of this. And so it was just put on the shelf. The publication came out of what it looked like, but nobody had actually tested it. And, and it wasn't until the Second World War that they started pulling some of these molecules off the shelf and just saying, let's see what they'll kill. Is it, will they kill an insect? And sure enough, DDT was really a miraculous thing. It, it killed, uh, you know, they just put very low amounts. They spread it on the wall, let flies land on it, and the flies just literally, within minutes of landing on the wall, just went, poom, 
fell to the ground and, and they were going wow we found the things that we need to, to work with well basically when we found these new molecules uh, we used them extensively and, and in many cases we used them exclusively for our pest management uh, whether it was in field crops or whether it was in urban habitats and, and we used them quite a bit they were tremendously effective however guess what happens when we keep treating the same insect with the same chemistry all the time well the insects started to develop resistance to that and, and so what was happening is especially in the 60s uh, there was a, a little old lady out of Pennsylvania called Rachel Carson uh, who wrote a, a book Silent Spring and, and she said it seems to me that we keep using more and more toxic of these synthetic organic molecules and what she meant by more and more toxic is not more and more toxic to the insects that we were having to use insecticides that were more and more toxic to us also and also we were finding out that some of these molecules uh, things like DDT have a long half-life in the environment and, and so they stayed in the environment for incredible periods of time meaning years rather than than days or months like we expect our insecticides today they were lasting for years and to give you an example one of my dad's favorite insecticides was chloridane uh, and, and uh, even to this day if you go out onto old golf courses you'll find on the greens that earthworms love golf course greens and they leave these little castings on there if you go to some old golf courses they have no earthworm castings on the greens and where some of these courses have had to expand the greens in other words make them bigger to to satisfy uh, the the amount of play that we get today and, and the players today they want a bigger place to land their ball on there it's kind of interesting some of these golf course superintendents find that where the old green is there's no earthworm castings but where they built the new green there's earthworm castings in there and of course they were calling us entomologists what's going on here what, what, what's uh, happening when we did analysis of that we found that the old green still had high levels of chloridane residue in them and the reason for that is the half-life of chloridane is 18 years and so when this was put down at pounds of active ingredient where you only need a fraction of a pound to kill an earthworm it takes quite a few years for that pounds of chloridane Per, per acre to dissipate down below a level where it's no longer active against the earthworms. So basically in, in the, this 1960s uh, and, and uh, up until the, the current time, professionals, uh, scientists, uh, environmentalists and so forth were saying, isn't there a better way to do this? And, and so that became into instead of our pest control strictly by pesticides, we came into what we consider to be the pest management era. The idea that maybe we shouldn't try to completely zero out every bug on the planet uh, and, and uh, uh, keep them away. Maybe we should uh, actually manage them. And more importantly, when we're going to manage them, maybe Maybe we ought to be using some of those old cultural controls that we did and we went back and checked literature and there was a lot of literature in the 20s 30s and, and early 40s about also using biological controls at, at that time so that's where we came into the past management area it still continues today most of the the applied researchers in my department are using that integrated pest management routine. Uh, they are testing certain chemicals, but they test those chemicals to see how they fit with cultural controls and biological controls into a, a bigger system. <clears throat> As I indicated to you uh, uh, before, uh, the current thinking is is this concept of sustainability. And I, uh, again, I, I like thinking about the concept, but I'm here to tell you we live in artificial environments we farm on artificial farming regimes and, and we're never going to uh, go back to uh, at least i don't want to ever go back to living in a hovel in a cave okay <laughs> I, I like my urban uh, conveniences and, and things and and so but to do that in an, in an artificial environment requires that i'm probably not going to be able to create one of those environments where everything is in check and everything is in balance i'm always going to have to be 
tinkering with the system uh, in a pest management to keep the pests that I don't want to be in my environment out of the way. Same thing with the field crops. There's a lot of, of talk now of, of uh, well, let's just go back and, and grow native plants and, and the, uh, well, yeah, I'm here, but I'm here to tell you that the reason why we have the agriculture the way that we have it today is that we can produce the amount of crop that is needed to sustain the human population. And, and actually, we're doing a pretty good job right now. If, if we actually could learn how to distribute our food correctly, we could probably feed everybody on the planet Earth uh, in, in a pretty good manner. But we, we don't do that. Uh, uh, but there's still the estimate that by uh, 2050 uh, on, it may be that the human population will even exceed our ability to produce uh, the, the crops that are needed to feed them, uh, irrespective of the distribution of that food. So again, I like the, the thinking about sustainability because we can ask questions. Again, in science, we always like to ask questions and then do some investigations. The, uh, you know, can we find the answers to those questions? Uh, uh, can we make a hypothesis? and test that and find out uh, whether it's true or not true. Like I indicated to you before, uh, in the 1960s, uh, we, we uh, were finding that more and more of the pests, uh, both in, in cropping systems and food systems, in forest systems, and even in our urban habitats, were becoming resistant to the, the pesticides. And, and because of that, we would have to go get the sort of the next up level of pesticide to be a bit more toxic. Now, do you see a similar thing going on in anything else? I'm thinking antibiotics, absolutely. We're, we're, we still haven't figured out that the antibiotics are in that same phase. We're, we're really doing the same thing. We just keep finding a, a, a more toxic and a more toxic antibiotic. And we're getting to the point now that the antibiotics are really getting toxic to us too. Uh, and, and so we have to be careful. And, and there's people saying maybe we should rethink how we're managing the the uh, uh, bacteria that are in our vi uh, in our environment, the the uh, uh, microbes and so forth. How did the ants do it? Do you remember that? The ants used a population of bacteria that p produced a different spectrum, a, a sort of a broad spectrum of different mixes of antibiotics and do that. And, and we're seeing that also occurring both in the insecticide world and in the antibiotic world. We're, we're seeing that they're actually mixing multiple modes of action, uh, which then are, are better capable of uh, controlling some of the microbes. So again, we're, we're just kind of at the cusp of looking at some of these other things. I've already mentioned Rachel Carson. The problem that I've got with Rachel Carson is that she got some of the story right, but she, in, in today's parlance, she made a lot of fake news too. And, and uh, I find it interesting. There's one passage, passage in there where she says, uh, uh, you know, we, we need to go back and rethink about what our forefathers used before these miracle chemicals came out. And, and she even said, uh, compounds such as lead, mercury, and arsenic. <laughs> and I go, whoa, wait a second. I, I'm not too sure I want to go that direction. Uh, but there, there were some other things that, that we should do. And as I stated in, in the, the 1960s, was, and, and actually this was a, the time that I was going to, to college in the late 60s, and, and I was hearing some of the, my biology friends and zoology friends and entomology friends talking about we need to be looking at other ways of managing uh, the, these pests other than just using a poison. I also indicated that in the 70s, that's when we really developed this concept of integrated pest management. We realized that, uh, and, and it was proven in the field also, if we only try to rely on biological control, it's going to fail. Sooner or later, it will fail. If we only try to rely on cultural control, the pests will find ways around it. They may overcome it and will fail. And so just like with just only pesticides or only cultural controls or only biological controls, we know that, that they would eventually fail. But what's kind of interesting is, is that if you're constantly monitoring the pests and their reaction to these things and, and are nimble enough to switch and change out what you're doing, you can do a pretty good job of managing the, the pests. And what do I mean by managing the pests? <laughs> 
again, not trying to kill them all, but to try to keep them at a low enough level that if it's in a crop, that I can still harvest my crop and make a profit of it. Uh, if it's a one that, that may be a vector, a mosquito that's vectoring, I know that if I can keep the mosquito population to a low enough level, that that sort of breaks the vectoring chain. We, we get a very low risk of, of them picking up a disease and then vectoring that disease. And, and so management means exactly that. We're going to try to keep these pests at a level where they don't cause significant damage or vector diseases or, or things like that. Now, how do I make decisions in this pest management? Well, I need to know what's going on. I can't just spray and walk away. I, I, I love this with, with homeowners. They call me all the time and say, I'm hiring this company to do bed bugs, uh, and, and they said they can do it in one treatment. I say, don't hire them. Any pest control company worth their salt will tell you, we will try to come in and clean out the bed bugs in one try, but we're going to come back and look again because the, the chance that a bed bug female may have escaped is fairly high. And if we don't get them all, if we don't eradicate them, we need to come back and, and do a, uh, some other subsequent treatments for that. <clears throat> what we find, in, especially in field crops and our food, fiber, uh, field crop areas and, and forestry areas, uh, that we in order to find out what the insects are doing and what the biological controls are doing and what the diseases are doing and how well our control techniques are, are doing, we need some elaborate sampling and monitoring techniques for that. And so uh, that's why I, I, I sort of joked in many of the labs I talked about, people say integrated pest management means I pay more. Uh, and in and, and actuality, when we, we put the nickels and dimes together on, on, on the table and really count it out. What we generally do is we spend more money doing the sampling and monitoring and decision making, but we spend less in the actual control techniques. And, and so we, we actually trade it. Now, what's the problem with the sampling and monitoring? To me, the biggest problem is that you need educated people to do this. Uh, and you need people with computer programs that understand what modeling of the populations mean and so forth. So uh, in pest management, we actually need more and more highly trained people. But we're seeing that in everything. The, the, the old concept of somebody working at a, a car factory just putting bolts and nuts on, on the, the end of a, a tire or something is over. How's that done now? Robotics. So now you need somebody that understands robotics and can understand how to program that robot and maintain that robot and, and so forth uh, to do the, the little mechanical job. And, and so we're doing the same thing when it comes to pest management. We, people, we need people that are highly educated to know how to sample, what the sampling means, and then be able to make decisions from what those sampling numbers tell them. So what is IPM? Uh, to me, IPM is the difference between a way of thinking and a program. Let me describe that. Even to this day, if you hire True Green to come take care of your lawn, they're going to do a program on your lawn. Let me describe that. What that means is that in March and April, they're going to come your, to your lawn, irrespective of whose lawn you are or anything else, and they're going to apply fertilizer and a pre-emergent herbicide to that lawn. In pest management, we would say, how does the lawn look? Does it need a fertilizer or not? Uh, if it had fertilizer last year, maybe it's perfectly green and, and perfectly thick. Are there, if it's really thick, will it really have crabgrass in it? Does it need a pre-emergent herbicide or not? But in a program, I don't make those decisions. Every lawn gets fertilizer. Every lawn gets a pre-emergent herbicide. Then in the second round, when I come in, in uh, uh, April and May, <clears throat> I'm going to apply fertilizer and a broadleaf herbicide. Everybody's going to get it, whether they need it or not. Whether you've got dandelions and clover in your lawn, you're still going to get a broadleaf herbicide. It's part of the program. Then in June and July, what I'm going to do is come in, guess what, going to apply more fertilizer, and I'll probably, oh, for the sake of it, I'll just put a general insecticide in there. 
because you might have some chinch bugs, you might have some bill bugs, you might have uh, some some uh, sod webworms or something uh, in your lawn. Then I'm going to come in August, uh, and in August I'm usually just going to apply fertilizer, but I do know that uh, your lawn probably needs grub control, but grub control is expensive. So I'm going to try to sell you a special grub control treatment at that time. So every lawn will at least get fertilizer, but I'll try to sell you a grub control. And then in the fall I'll come back and I'll guess what I'm going to apply again? A little more fertilizer, and I'll probably throw that broadleaf weed control in there again. And so what was the decision made in the program? Nothing. The, the agronomist for the company already said, this is the program. All you have to do, and, and actually, we, we joked in the, the industry, the only thing you needed to do with Kim Lawn and True Green is be able to read a road map and do the accounting uh, for that. And Oh, and by the way, pull the hose to spray things or uh, run a, a spreader to spread things because you didn't have to make a decision whatsoever. It, it, the, that was all done. Now, in integrated pest management, what I need now is an educated person. I need an educated person that can make a decision. Are there any broadleaf weeds in this lawn? If there are, then I don't need an herbicide for that. Has this lawn ever had grubs in it? If the answer is no, it's never had a grub problem in it, I don't need a grub insecticide. But if it did have grubs in the past, then I'm probably at high risk of having grubs. So maybe I to, that, then I should probably sell that in that particular case. So again, a way of thinking is that monitoring, making decisions, uh, deciding at the spur of the moment what's really needed or not needed uh, at that. <clears throat> Preventive versus reactive, uh, and this has changed. It used to be that virtually any bug that you showed me, I could tell you an insecticide that you could come back later that day or tomorrow and kill it. That was our insecticide technology. That, that's how good our insecticides were. We now have insecticides that really don't work very well on any insect at any time. Uh, to give an example, uh, you took a look at, uh, to the, uh, this week at GrubX, which has that uh, uh, chloranter nilaprol insecticide in it. Chloranter nilaprol only affects young larvae. And the way that it affects young larvae is it gives them lockjaw. It, it affects their muscle system so that if they bite onto something, they can't loosen their muscles and they literally will starve to death because they can't eat anything. Now an older insect uh, can get the same muscle cramps but it can like you it can walk off the muscle cramps. It's got enough fat body in its body that it can withstand that chemical until it, it detoxifies it and goes about its way. So it used to be that we had always say that uh, we don't really need to, to know or, or prevent pests uh, because we could just uh, say, oh, the pests have reached this level, we can go out and nuke them. But now we're saying, no, we really need to use our technology to prevent the pests. And, and so much of our strategy now is, is in prevention. <clears throat> now, I find it interesting, if you take a look in plant pathology, they always said, all of our fungicides only work as a preventive. In other words, we, we have to put this fungicide coating on the plant so that when a fungal spore lands on the leaf, that will keep that spore from germinating. And, and so uh, we didn't have any uh, reactive materials. All of our stuff were preventive. But guess what? There are new fungicides that are coming out now have some curative or reactive capability. So that changes the ball game there. Now we can, we can make a decision that let's just wait until this disease begins to express itself and then we can knock it down rather than saying, well, the conditions are right for this disease to express itself, so let's put this down now and prevent it from ever occurring. <coughs> Also in integrated pest management, remember we always have to keep in mind we have chemical control, cultural control, and biological control options. And, and we need to, to ask ourselves, are, are, the, all, are any of these options better than the others? Or are some of these options, if we use them together, work better than just a single option? And then finally, uh, in integrated pest management, I've kind of alluded to this, we have a concept that we call pest thresholds. And what do we mean by that? Well, 
In integrated pest management, the mere peasant presence of a pest doesn't mean you have to do anything. Now you should you should take notice. Okay? I'm here to tell you if you find a bed bug on your couch at home and call me up, I'm going to ask a bunch of questions. I'm going to say, is that the only one you found? Yes. Does it look like it's a big bed bug? I don't know. Well, take a picture of it and send it to me. Now I get back to him. Yeah, that was an adult. Looks like you may have picked up an adult bed bug, which are generally the most common hitchhikers, and brought it home. And it may be that you caught it quick enough. So if you kill that one bed bug, you're you're good. Okay? But I'm here to tell you, maybe you brought home a couple of others. So just keep on the watch. Keep looking around. If you find a couple of other bed bugs, or more importantly, you find some nymphal bed bugs you're in trouble. You've got an infestation. You need to control that. You need to manage it. Okay? So those are pest thresholds. Now, what do you think the problem of using pest thresholds in our human habitats? People don't like them. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I can't tell you the number of times that, that I've had homeowners call me up and they, they said, I found a cockroach. Okay. What did you do? Well, I stepped on it. Well, I think you're good. Now, if you find a whole bunch more cockroaches, give me a call. Uh, but, but again, a, a single pest in, in somebody's mind can just send them into a frenzy. Uh, and and uh, But, you know, as far as we're concerned is, is that I need to make sure. And, and actually what I'm asking when it goes to that bed bug, when it's going to the cockroach, what I'm trying to assess is do you have a pest that has established itself in this environment and is in a breeding population? That's when we really need to get busy and do something about it. Now, sometimes, uh, you know, we always need definitions, and, and I'm here to tell you there, there are long definitions and short definitions of integrated pest management. I kind of like this one. Uh, it, it's a fairly short definition and, and to me fulfills all the things that I need uh, for, for integrated pest management. <clears throat> the first thing is IPM is a process. Can you tell me what the processes are? We've already talked about them. Sampling and monitoring, determine the pest thresholds, and making decisions. So it's, a, it's an ongoing process. So we need to select, we need to integrate them together and implement biological, chemical, and cultural controls. And, and we also have to keep in mind that all of this stuff costs money. And I'm here to tell you, I can control almost any pest you want to, to have controlled with a chemical, biological, or cultural control. But they're all going to be different in cost in here. But generally, if, if I sort of meld these things together, I can normalize that cost out. And I can make it economically viable to use. We talk about the ecology. And, and typically, that's where we start questioning some of the pesticides that we use, because we know that many of the pesticides have non-target effects. And, and we have to be careful about that. DDT, the reason why DDT got banned is that it was bioaccumulating in the environment and ending up in our raptor birds. And what we found is that one of the secondary degradation byproducts of DDT, DDE, actually acts as a female hormone. And what it was doing is it was preventing the eggshell formation in birds. Uh, and, and so they weren't forming normal shells around the eggs. The, the shells, instead of being this, this hard calcium, was sort of a soft leathery material that would break apart and, and the embryo couldn't develop uh, in there. So I have to keep the, the environment and the ecology uh, involved in here. And we have to understand sociological consequences. Uh, I'm here to tell you, I can manage mosquitoes pretty well uh, but if they're transmitting diseases, that's going to be unacceptable. Um, and so we have to know those sociological consequences. I need to know the sociological consequences of a homeowner that has expectations of no pests in their home. Uh, because that, that's really kind of unrealistic. And, and so we have to, we, we 
you know, gen generally emphasize that IPM is this integration of biological, chemical, and cultural control. But we do have to remember the consequences of that, both economically, ecologically, and sociologically. Like I told you, there can be really complicated IPM division. Uh, that, this is always considered to be the, the gold standard. Uh, uh, Vandenbosch and Flint uh, uh, came out again in, in the early 80s with this really complicated definition of, of integrated pest management. But if you look at this, you can really kind of distill it back into what, what I just gave you in that smaller one. They're talking here is, is uh, you know, they're saying it's an ecologically based strategy. Well, I put ecology in, in that other one. We're going to make uh, uh, decisions here that, that disrupt the, the uh, pests. Uh, we're going to use pesticides, but only after we've done some monitoring and sampling and, and so forth, uh, that, that decision making. And, and so you can again see uh, that, that their slant here, when they first made this de definition, they were trying to really emphasize more of the biological and cultural control and sort of lessen the reliance on chemical control. But uh, my previous definition, uh, if, if you take out the, the biasness that was occurring at this time still fulfills these requirements. Sometimes it's easier to say what something isn't as opposed to what something is. And to me, IPM is not a biological control program. Biological control is merely one of our tactics. It's not the only tactic, but it's one of the tactics and, and we always ask ourselves. Now, Biological control can fit just fine in certain certain circumstances, but not in others. To give you an example, uh, back in the, the early 1980s, when this was uh, going rampant, uh, at the University of Maryland, they decided to introduce a little parasitic wasp in the student dorms to control cockroaches. Now this little wasp looks like a little, uh, it does look like a little wasp. It's, it's a, oh, a little bit more than a quarter of an inch long. Looks kind of like an ant, but it has wings on it and can sort of jump and fly around and so forth. Uh, but it's very good. Uh, this thing will, will get in all the cracks and crevices. When it finds a cockroach egg case, an oothica, it will lay its egg in that egg case and its larva will eat the oothica so that there's no cockroaches that, that hatch out. Guess what the number one complaint after a year of this parasitoid was in, in the dorms? The wasp. They had forgotten they had cockroaches, but they didn't like, the, you know, they're sitting there studying, all of a sudden there's this little wasp that goes walking across their desk, and they go, ah, what is this thing? Wah! Let's kill that thing. And, and so they were complaining about that. And, and so, you know, there are, remember that sociological consequences that, that we put in our, our, in that case, that biological control, even though it was very effective, was not acceptable to the people that were in that building. And, and so uh, it's not a biological control program. Biological control is just one of the things that we use. <laughs> There's a lot of misconception that this happened in our school IPM program. A lot of people think IPM means organic. No, it doesn't. Uh, now I have, we, we We've got no problem with using organic products, and, and generally when we're using cultural controls and biological controls, that still, that could fit in many of those of, of organic, but uh, generally in, in uh, integrated pest management, we always want to keep that pesticide available in case we need it. Uh, we, we might need that decision to do that. Now, what about organic pesticides? I have no problem with that. But again, being a scientist, the first thing I ask, if anybody says, why don't you use this product because it's organic, first thing I ask, is it effective? You know, I'm not just going to just going to use organic just because of window dressing. It has to be effective for me. And, and I'm here to tell you, there's a lot of bio-based organic materials out there that are totally ineffective. Uh, we're seeing a lot of these coming on the market uh, now. The things like lemon oil, cedar oil, garlic oil, while they, they sound great and wonderful, uh, unless you drown the insect in those oils, uh, they're not effective. And, and so don't waste your money on them. On the other hand, we talked about uh, in laboratory, you, you looked up the LD50 of azadiractin. Uh, that happens to be a botanical insecticide that also, depending on the formulation that it has, is a certified organic material. 
IPM is never a pesticide free program. Unfortunately, in the 80s and 90s, one of the goals of IPM was stated was to reduce pesticide. Fortunately, we've now gone past that. Uh, typically, the result of using integrated pest management, where I say I want to consider biological control and cultural control, automatically reduces the amount of pesticide that we use. More importantly, if I go to that way of thinking where I sample and monitor the pest populations and ask the question, is the pest population at a level where I need the pesticide, that usually cuts pesticide usage in a half. Uh, where I was just using it on a regularly timed schedule, now I'm try trying to make a decision with it. <clears throat> Boy, I wish I could deliver the Walmart brand of integrated pest management, but I can't. Uh, when we do the economics of integrated pest management, we always find that integrated pest management is usually either slightly more than the standard spray, spray, spray program, but in many cases, we can trade the cost of, by reducing the, the amount of chemical inputs. Uh, we trade that off with the people doing sampling and monitoring and making decisions. And so in many cases, it's basically an equal trade if we use integrated pest management when it comes to cost. Well, now that I've told you what integrated pest management is, let me again remind you what it is. First, it's a decision-making process. In other words, it's not a program, it's a process. I, I have to monitor the pests, make decisions as to what's going on in their populations, and adjust those chemical, cultural, biological control things that are going on. I've also indicated that, that we also have to keep in mind the cost of this program. Uh, we, we have to uh, take a look at, at what is it doing to the environment and the ecology uh, in, in that system. And we have to understand that there are sociological values and restrictions that people have uh, that, that are placed on this system. How do I make the, that decision-making process? I have to do sampling and monitoring on a regular basis. And I always have to ask the question, what can I use to do the management at this time? Uh, is, is chemical control more appropriate at this time? Or is cultural control more appropriate? Is biological control more appropriate? Or can I use a combination of those together to achieve my goal of pest management? Now let's go back to some of the, uh, and I, I kind of apologize if you take a look at this, it, it, all the terms in here, the, if any of you are gamers that play some of these battle games, uh, these really look like, uh, you know, war. <laughs> and I think the reason why it, it looks like war is that most of this terminology was developed by people who came out of the Second World War. And, and so we, we use, you know, tactics and strategies and, and so forth. But, you know, you that aside, to me, they're, they're useful terms that allow us to discuss what's going on here. So I've got a bunch of strategies in here, and, and my first strategy is always tolerance. Do I really need to do anything? And, and, uh, and I don't freak out when a housefly gets in my house. Uh, it, it's, uh, you know, my wife might have a slightly different opinion of that. Uh, and, and so eventually I'll get up off the couch and I'll go get the fly swatter and whack it. Uh, but uh, I have taught her that when a spider gets into our basement, she knows at least to call me now, and I'll come over and I'll pick up the spider and I'll toss it out the door. Uh, now she's not going to do that, uh, but that's better than what she used to do. She used to just step on it and then say, uh, "David, come pick up this squash spider." Uh, and so, uh, but now we'll usher, we'll tolerate them uh, and usher them out the door. <coughs> Again, we've talked about eradication, that completely eliminating the pest populations, and, and eradication is generally not what we consider to be in the IPM genre, uh, but we still use eradication, especially for exotic pests, things that have come in where we want to get rid of them. And, and when I'm talking about bed bugs, yes, you do want to eradicate all the bed bugs in your home. 
because uh, if you just leave one female there, you're going to have them back again. And, and so uh, it, it's still a useful idea and concept. It's just that we don't normally consider eradication when we're dealing with large field crop areas or fruit and vegetable production and, and so forth. Prevention is also a, a useful concept. Can we knock the population out, let's say, early in the season? Uh, and, and there's a big debate going on right now with turf entomologists. There's one turf entomologist that said, if you put a ring of insecticide around the outside perimeter of the golf course fairways and greens, you'll kill this little weevil as it comes out of the woodlots that it's overwintered in before it gets to the green and reproduce. And, and he's saying, that's my preventive strategy. Uh, and, and the other entomologist said, well, but we've got curative insecticides. We can just wait until it gets out there on the fairway uh, and, and then spray them then. And, and I don't care. Uh, the, you know, and the golf course superintendent doesn't care. He just wants to know how do I keep this weevil from damaging my, my golf course and, and whether I use a preventive strategy or whether I use a curative strategy. Really, an integrated pest management, when it deals primarily with food, fiber, and forestry, we're talking about suppression. Uh, and all we want to do is suppress the population down to a level that we get a good yield out of our crop, or we get good forest products, or the animals that I'm rearing uh, produce what they need to produce, whether it's, it's wool or meat or something else. Uh, I don't need the pests that are uh, in these environments to be at a zero level. In many cases, all I have to do is just sort of knock off the top of the population uh, and, and keep them from damaging that crop. Again, here are some of the tactics. And, and here I'm going to expand some things. Uh, uh, what do you think chemical control is? That's primarily our pesticides. Biological controls, I've uh, again talked about the three P's there, and I'll mention that again, predators, parasites, and, and uh, uh, pathogens in there. But here's where I've expanded cultural control. These really are, are all, what when I put that model up for integrated pest management, cultural control can also include these other things, such as, as mechanical physical control. <laughs> Homeowners get really upset with me when they call me and say, Dr. Shelley, we've got Japanese beetles in our yard. How do I get rid of them? Well, you can go around with a little can of soapy water and just knock them off into that soapy water and, and kill them that way. No, I want, them, I want to spray them and have them hit the ground screaming. Okay, I understand that. Uh, the fly swatter that I talked about, perfectly good control there. There's some really interesting ones that have been used in the past. Uh, back in the, the 1930s, we had a major outbreak of grasshoppers uh, in the Midwest that were eating all the corn and wheat. And some of the enterprising farmers developed what they call a hopper dozer. What in the world was this? Well, if you take a look at this, it actually looks like, you know what a, a backstop on a baseball field looks like? You know, that, that screen that, that sort of overhangs a little bit. Well, they made a smaller version of that with like hog wire in it. They cut the little slits where the rows of the corn could go and they attached this to the, the front end of their tractor. And so what they did is they ran down the field with this hopper dozer going through the field and all the grasshoppers that were on the corn jumped up in front of this. And when they got to the end of the field, they just released it and dropped it down, doused it with kerosene, and burned all the grasshoppers. <laughs> Hopper dozer. And, and, and so, again, that would be a mechanical, physical uh, control with that. There's a great deal of research now going on into host plant resistance. We find out that, that many of our, our crops have genes that allow them to either tolerate or resist pests. And if we can, if we can increase the, that genetics uh, of those, and, and that's actually where the first green revolution came about, is that we developed wheat and corn that had genetic resistance to many of the diseases that were taking over those. And now we have say, those same plants. Uh, but unfortunately, in many of those plants, in order to get the genetic control that we need to have, let's say, in a corn plant or a soybean plant, we actually have to put a gene into it. We've genetically engineered that plant now to be resistant to the pest. That's what most of our genetic engineering is really going into. 
We can have genetic control. We've got several people here at the Ohio State University that's working on this. We have the ability right now to infect a mosquito with a virus. The virus won't kill the mosquito, but it will insert a gene into the mosquito that sterilizes the mosquito. Wow. That, that's pretty nifty. So we can do genetic control. Uh, one of the old techniques, uh, we used to have a, a major fly pest in, in the southwest uh, that, that was called the, the screwworm fly. It would get up into the, the head and brain area of livestock and, and sometimes kill them. Uh, and it was very difficult to control with pesticides, and, and so the USDA took it upon themselves to undergo what they call a sterile male control program. They raised millions of these screwworm, screwworm flies. They irradiated them, which sterilized the males. They released all these male flies, and the nifty part of this is that when a screwworm female mates, she's done. She will not mate again. So if we inundated the environment with these sterile males, when she would mate with a sterile male, she thought, oop, my duty is done. She would go over and lay eggs, but the eggs wouldn't hatch. Pretty nifty, okay? That we would consider that genetic control. We have behavioral control, uh, trapping systems. We use a lot of pheromone traps to trap a lot of our pests, and, and we use these pheromones often to monitor the pests, but in certain insects, we can use the pheromones also to disrupt their behavior. Uh, actually, we did this last year. Uh, most of you weren't here in the summertime, but uh, in June, uh, there were fixed winging airplanes flying back and forth over campus and if you look at them carefully it looked like something was coming out of some nozzles in the back of it. What was it? It was gypsy moth pheromone flakes and what they were doing is uh, the, these flakes have no effect on you. Uh, the, the I don't like it, the idea it was plastic but uh, it, it was put out that way and in essence uh, we blanketed the campus with gypsy moth female sex pheromone. So when a male gypsy moth hatched out, he goes, whoa, there's women all around me. And so he would literally fly in circles and whatever, and even though there might have been a gypsy moth actual female very near him, he couldn't find her. She was masked by all of the other pheromone that we had put in the air for that. So that would be a behavioral control in there. We also have regulatory control. You're, you're probably all familiar with, uh, if you go into any of the state parks, it says, do not move firewood. Why? There's a law for that. We don't want you to move firewood that might move something like emerald ash borer or the Asian longhorn beetle or something like that. So those are regulatory controls. Have any of you traveled overseas and come back and gone through customs? Yeah. <laughs> what do they ask you on that custom sheet? Do you have any cheese? Do you have any meat? Uh, did you go visit a farm? And if you answer yes to any of those, now if you even if you've got the cheese and the meat and answer no, guess what? There's a puppy dog down there that can smell it. <laughs> so I wouldn't advise it. Why do they want to know if you've been on a farm? They'll actually say, I need to see your shoes. And if your shoes have dirt or oil on it, they will spray a sanitizer on that to, to kill off any microbes or parasites that might have been on the farm that you visited that you could bring to North America and, and bring them in. So uh, we, we've got those regulatory controls. Now let's take a look at, at how we use integrated pest management on, in crops. Uh, th this is primarily crops. Uh, fruits and vegetables is, is where integrated pest management really got its start. It's where its foundation is. And the problem that we've got with that is that when we try to move integrated pest management into these non-crop areas, uh, we, we do run into some problems. We'll talk about those later on. <clears throat> Generally in this one, we're going to sample the pest populations on a regular basis. We're going to go out when the crop first comes up and say, you know, are there any pests? And, and then, on a, uh, you know, every two weeks or so, we go back and, and do this monitoring. Now, to me, this is one of the good things. Uh, monitoring is really tough for pests without a person. 
even though there are people that are trying to get drones to do this and, and robots to do this and so forth, you really need a person to run that sweep net and pull out all the insects and count how many you got and, and so forth. So that one to me looks like a, a job opportunity that's got probably got some security uh, in the long run. Then what I also have to do is, is I have to compare the pest populations with what we call this economic injury level. And I'll try to explain that here in a minute. We do know that at a cert, only at a certain level of pests do I cause a reduction in my crop. And, and, and so the, we, we can model that out. We can figure that all out. We can also, if we take a look at the average insect growth population, remember those S-shaped curves that I talked about when we talked about uh, uh, or, you know, any kind of a population uh, and its growth? Well, we know that on that S-shaped curve, that if I reach a certain point on that S-shaped curve, it's, the population is likely to reach another point on that curve. And, and so we can do that. We call that the threshold. So what I would do by sampling and monitoring, plotting that out and say, oh, they've reached this point on their growth curve. If I control them now, they won't reach this point on the growth curve where they actually damage my crop. So that's the difference between the economic injury level and the economic threshold level. I want to control my pest at the threshold level so that they don't get up to the injury level. Now let me try to show that to you in, in a graph. Okay, so in in this one, what I've got is is the insect population in red right here. So typically, let let's say the the crop is growing along here early in the season. The overwintered pests start their population, and as they grow, they're again you can see that logistic curve that's in here. What I do on this is, is that, and again, uh, this quite, takes quite a bit of research with, with field crop entomologists and, and physiologists and so forth. What I know is that if my pest population reaches this level right here, that's going to, ca that's going to cause a significant loss in the yield from that crop. And the loss in the yield means I don't get my money from the crop. On the other hand, I know that if I control the pest down here, that means it won't reach the economic injury level, but if I can uh, knock it out here, that often will zero the population down and it may take it quite a while to build back up again. And if I can harvest my crop before this gets back, boom, I'm home free. Now what if I've got a crop that, that takes a lot longer to grow than this? Well, again, as this population comes up, if it does reach that economic threshold again, I might have to make a second treatment in that crop. But again, the beauty of this, by doing this monitoring, I can make the decision, oh, I need to treat it now. After I've done the treatment, I can monitor it again, and I can look at it and say, I'm going to harvest this crop before they reach that damaging level again, or no, they're building back up again. I better knock them down because my crop's going to need longer to be in the field before I harvest it. So again, that's the decision-making process that I was talking about. Now, how is this used in, in massive crops? Uh, we, you know, uh, when I spent my time in Pennsylvania, I was always wondering how in the world these uh, Pennsylvania farmers even make a living. Uh, in, in here, but they do pretty well uh, with, with the small fields. Uh, integrated pest management is, is very commonly used in a big scale in these large farming operations. Uh, I'm here to tell you, I, I have a sharecropper in, in Kansas right now, and, and uh, he farms my like 300 acres of, of uh, soybean and, and wheat fields. And I asked him, I, I said, hey, uh, uh, how many acres do you actually tend to? And he says, we're, we're up to 2,000 now. And I go, wow. And he says, but Dave, at, at 2,000, we're just barely making a living. <laughs> I, you know, I wish I could get some more farms. We really need to go up to about 3,000 where we could actually make enough money that we could take a vacation and buy new equipment and, and so forth. So uh, it's, it's, uh, farming is a tough business, folks. Let me give you an idea 
of how this works. And, and in this one, I just went to the internet and, and looked up some decision-making algorithms for different pests. And I thought this one was pretty good. Uh, this is off the, the website down in Kentucky. And what they've done here is that uh, these are the treatment guidelines for potato leaf hopper in Kentucky. Now, you're probably thinking this is in potato. No, this is actually in alfalfa. <clears throat> the potato leaf hopper, when it comes into alfalfa, when it feeds on the stem, it causes everything that's above that stem to wither and die. And, and so, as you can see here, I have different thresholds for this. So, if I've got alfalfa that, that after I've mowed it and harvested it, if the new growth of it is less than, than three inches, only 20 leaf hoppers per my 100 sweeps. And what do I mean by 100 sweeps? I'm going to take my, my sweep net insect and I'm going to pace one, two, three, four until I get 100 of those sweeps. Then I look in that net and I can't actually I stick it in my killing char because these things jump and fly pretty easily. So I get it out, dump it into a tray and, and let's say that when that alfalfa was at, at three stems or three inches and I had 10 leaf hoppers in it, guess what I need to do? I need to mark on my calendar that I need to come back when it's three to six inches. In other words, I'm, I, I, I say the leaf hoppers are here, they haven't reached a level yet that will cause any damage. So I'll come back in about a week and a half when my alfalfa is in, in the uh, six-inch six stage. I'll do my 100 sweeps, but now notice that since the alfalfa is older, I need more pests to cause damage there. So now my threshold is up to 50. So I do my sweeps again. I ended up with 30. Go, eh, that's getting kind of close, but I don't need to spray yet. So now when it, I come back another week and a half later or two weeks, it's now at, at 10 inches. Now I need 100 of them. But it's been really good weather. It's been nice, dry weather and, and warm. And I get 110 leaf hoppers in my sweep net. What do I need to do? spray <laughs> okay but if it was below that then I could come back but basically what I wanted you to see here is that depending on the vulnerability of the crop when the crop is small and tender doesn't take many pests to cause some damage and reach that economic threshold when it's about ready to harvest no it takes a whole bunch of them to cause economic damage Well, what about urban environments? Uh, the, the reality is, is that there are pests in our urban environments. And, and here's a picture of uh, over here in, in uh, uh, Gahanna as I'm coming into the airport. And you can see, boy, there, there's a lot of diversity and, and a lot of things going on in this habitat. <clears throat> and this is where I come in. <laughs> this is the system that I have to operate in. The reality is, is, is almost anywhere you go in the country, our urban habitats generally will have. Every neighborhood you go into, sure, there, there's always the obvious plants, but if you really take a look, you'll see everybody has a different group of flowers in there, different shrubs in there, different trees in their yards, and so forth. Almost any of the habitats, you can easily find about 100 species of plants that are used in our urban habitats. Each one of those plants will at least have one critical pest on it. And maybe they'll have up to, to four or five pests. So if you just multiply that out in corn, where I only have to deal with three or four pests for the whole cornfield, what do I have to do in my urban area? I'm talking about 100 to 500 pests that the bug doc has to keep track of. Wow, that, that's, that's whew, how do I do that? Well, there was another entomologist. He, uh, Mike is my same age. He just retired also the, this year uh, at the University of Maryland. Uh, and basically back in the 80s, he said, we need to take a look at, can we develop integrated pest management in the urban system? And he did the numbers too. He said, you know, we've got 100 different kinds of plants. Uh, we, we've got uh, at least one pest on each one of those plants. How do we do this? And so they actually implemented, they started just sampling and surveying the pests in a neighborhood. And what they found is that, indeed, 
there were a hundred different kinds of plants. Uh, uh, actually, I think he said there were about 110 plants that they found in this neighborhood. Each one of them had at least one pest on it. But what he found out is that of all those hundred plus plants, there were only about five of them that had 90% of the pest problems. Ooh, that's kind of interesting. So, and, and can you guess what they were? Rose, flowering plum, flowering cherry. Now, for those of you that know your botany, all of those are in the family Rosaceae. Uh, it's, it's kind of interesting. The plants that are in the family Rosaceae are really susceptible to a lot of our pests. He also found out that there were only a, about a half a dozen insects that really posed any risk of either killing the plant or damaging the plant so badly that it was unsuitable for the landscape. So he developed two terms. He said, we're going to identify those plants that are most susceptible to this damage and, and get most of the damage as key plants, and we're going to call those pests that cause really significant damage key pests. When they did that, they reduced that 100 to 500 critters down to about a dozen. And, and so by doing that, you really simplify the system. What does this mean? What it really meant is that if you're going to do integrated pest management in the landscape, what we recommend, and there are companies that are doing this, first thing that we recommend is you go in and you do a survey of all the plants that are in the landscape. Wow. And guess what? The, the homeowners that were under Mike Rout's program, when they were given a survey at the end of the, the three years that they did this program, they said, what was the thing of most value? And they said, the map that showed me that my plants. Most homeowners don't even know what plants they've got. <laughs> to them, it's a tree. Uh, and, uh, but they said, no, it was really neat. I could talk to other people that I've got an oak tree here, a maple tree over there, and, and a willow tree over there. And, and so they were able to talk uh, more definitive uh, about that. And, and so they also said, it was really nice that you didn't spray everything. You only sprayed a couple of those key plants at the time that the key pests were there. And so they were able to, to dramatically reduce the pest management going on in there. <coughs> Give you an idea how this works. If you contact Davy Tree or one of the other uh, uh, landscape maintenance uh, companies, here's what they're going to do with your trees and shrubs. They're going to fertilize in the spring and fall whether the trees or shrub need it or not. They're going to mulch it in the springtime, and then they're going to put down a pre-emergent herbicide so that you don't get weeds in your flower beds and things like that. Then they're going to visit your property four to five times, and of course they expect to get paid every time they visit your landscape. And what are they going to do? They're going to spray all of your plants with a cocktail. What is that cocktail going to have? It's going to have a miticide, insecticide, and a fungicide in it. Oh, and, and I found out recently they're adding a little bit of oil and soap, and, many, and in many cases they're putting cedar oil in it because they say our, home, our homeowners like the smell of the cedar oil in here. What decision was made? No, this is a program. I'm just doing the, the same thing on a regular basis. And in actuality, what's the problem with applying an insecticide and miticide four to five times a year to every plant in the landscape? I'm killing everything. Bees, wasps, beneficial predators, parasitoids, I'm knocking them all out. And, and we've actually done some surveys in these landscapes. We find out that many of these landscapes actually have worse pest problems than landscapes that haven't had a dang thing done on them. Wow. Talk about job security. Now, here's a, when I, when I saw this lawn over in Pataskala a few years ago, I had to slam on my brakes, backed up and took a picture of it. Looks pretty good to you. This, this is what I call the, the, the average landscape that we would typically find in a suburban uh, central Ohio area. And boy, when I took a look at that one, if I were a, a lawn and landscape care company, I would be licking my chops for this one. Why? Well, I needed a purple leaf something or other. So I've got a purple leaf plum over here. 
that's going to get uh, fungal diseases on the leaves. Uh, it's going to get Japanese beetles eating the leaves all summer. It's going to get leaf rollers, and more importantly, it's going to get the peach tree borer down below ground where you can't see it that's going to girdle it and kill it in about five to six years. Okay? Uh, I've got a European white bark birch here. Birch leaf miner, birch leaf aphids, and bronze birch borer, again, are going to take it out. If I don't treat it every year, that are going to take that out in about four to six years. Uh, I've got variegated euonymus back here, right, right in there, which the euonymus scale loves to feed on and, and take out. And if that doesn't work on it, uh, then black vine weevils will, will eat the roots of that and, and kill it out that way. Heaven knows what this thing is. This pine, uh, this this foo foo pine that's in the front there. Now I, I do know what that is. That that's what they call a tabletop white pine that's been top grafted on there. Oh, white pine weevil loves it. Uh, it's going to kill the top out of it, the, the center part out of it. Uh, the pine uh, needle scales are going to get in there, and the pine sawflies are going to work it over, and, and so forth. So, uh, and, and of course, this was the, the typical uh, uh, sodded lawn of Kentucky bluegrass, and I'll guarantee that the sod came pre-installed with bluegrass billbugs and chinch bugs in it. Wow. Are there alternatives to this? Yeah. If you want a purple leaf doodad, I can give you a purple leaf doodad. There's a really beautiful purple leaf Norway maple that doesn't get any of the insects that I talked about and probably will live longer than the house will be there. Okay. How about why did I have the white bark birch? Well, uh, I like that white bark. Okay. Uh, there, there are some red maples that have really nice white bark on them and again don't get any of those insects or mites or diseases that are in there. How about the turf? Turf type tall fescue. Bill bugs die if they try to eat it. Chinch bugs die if they try to eat it. Sod webworms die if they try to eat it. Also turf type tall fescue has a very deep and fibrous root system. It takes twice as many grubs to kill that grass as it does to kill Kentucky bluegrass. So for every one of these plants in here, I can give you an alternate that is highly resistant or tolerant of pests and greatly will reduce the need for controls. Why aren't those, pe those plants used? Hmm? <laughs> They actually cost about 50% more. Okay, but I look at this. Okay, just you know, if you just paid me 50% more to install your landscape, then you'll never have to pay me on the other end. I won't have to come back on an annual basis and treat the pests on, on these plants. So it's one of those things. Do you want to make the investment up front? and yield the, the, quote, profits of that later on, or do I want a, a cheap landscape up front that I have to pay for and then probably replace on a regular basis? How do we do the integrated pest management approach? I've already talked about this. We map the landscape. Uh, we identify those key plants, key pests, and so forth. What are we trying to do in integrated pest management? Again, I've shown you this model. We're trying to equally uh, uh, give cred credence to chemical, cultural, biological controls. What are we doing right now? Primarily in our urban landscapes, we're relying almost exclusively on chemical controls. We do some monitoring uh, in, in there, uh, and, and uh, but we use almost no biological or cultural controls in there. Ideally, we think that if you really pay attention what we could do is greatly increase the biological and cultural controls, and a lot of that cultural control would be replace the susceptible plants, those key plants with plants that don't get the pests on them. That would automatically reduce the amount of chemical control that we would need. Um, the final thing that I wanted to give in the, this particular talk is that we are now moving from pest management to that plant health idea. And the idea of, of plant health is that we do know that plants that are, I hate to say this, healthy, 
And, and we could get into a lot of discussion on, on what is healthy, but a plant that is in the right environment, that has the right amount of food and the right amount of water and the right amount of sunlight, generally can make its own defensive chemicals that will allow it to withstand most insect, mite, and disease attack. In plant health, the plant is now the center. Guess what? If it's in the urban environment, it's also the owner of that plant. I'm here to tell you, I have more problems trying to explain to the homeowner why this plant is having a problem than the plant. The plant doesn't care. It just says, take care of me. So on this one, we evaluate the plant. Is it doing what it needs to be do or needs to be done in that landscape? Or do I need to, to intervene? When I need to intervene, I might need to figure out, is it under stress? Can I relieve that stress? Or does it have a pest and I need to implement a management of that particular pest? As a matter of fact, we have an entire program here at The Ohio State University. We've developed a, a Master's of Plant Health Management. It's a non-thesis uh, master's program uh, that, that's being developed for this. Most of the program can be met online. Uh, you, can, you can take most of the courses, uh, and, and this course would actually qualify for you to begin taking many of those courses. Uh, and, and so uh, uh, take a look at that. You might have some interest. If you're getting close to graduating, not, still not sure what you're going to do for a job, uh, and, and you like being outdoors quite a bit, uh, Masters of Health Plan, uh, Plant Health Management might be an option for you.